we're moving on to the next mark of an overcomer. Let's just remind ourselves of the, the first mark of an overcomer, where he was humble. And that he realized in himself that he actually could not make himself, could not get himself through. His own strength and ability didn't allow him to be over, an overcomer. And as we humbled ourselves, we could turn to the Lord. And the second mark of the overcomer was that he was born of God. We're called not only to be born, not just to begin that journey, to be, go on to mature it. And even as we were speaking this morning about dealing with some of those flaws in our character, that are, as we overcome those, we overcome the enemy. We cut out the opportunity for the enemy to come into our lives and to cause traffic. But as we deal with those things, actually, we start overcoming. And then we began to look at those next two marks of an overcomer. We found those in Revelation 12, verse 10. First of all, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And then second, by the word of our testimony. And we're all speaking about the power of covenant there. The covenant that is in Jesus Christ. The covenant that is in his blood. The covenant that is in his word. The covenant and that we testify of that covenant. You know, in everything we've so, seen so far, we're seeing that unless we step on and choose to go to becoming under, uh, overcomers, unless we choose to be overcomers, we're going to find ourselves being undertakers. And so today I want to return to a verse that we've looked at earlier, which is 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Because that verse tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And the four, fifth, the sixth mark of an overcomer is that we overcome by our faith. And when we read that verse, my thoughts, and I don't know about yours, immediately turn to Hebrews chapter 11. In that book, the author of Hebrews has just spent 10 chapters laying out the foundations of how the body and blood of Jesus bring us not only into the kingdom, but into the very access throne room of God. His blood, his body has done that. And the author of Hebrews calls us to be overcomers. The chapter 11 has got some of the most famous verses that we use very often. One of the defining verses we use about faith is there. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that verse continues, though we don't often quote it. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Because of their faith, they were able to make that testimony that we see in Mark number five. Because as we look at the sixth mark, the mark of faith in the life of an overcomer. Verse three continues that the creation that we see was created by what we don't see. Everything about faith is what is in the invisible is grabbed hold of and brought into the visible by faith. Everything that is the grace of God is brought into the life, our life, by our faith. And as we look at chapter 11 of Hebrews, an amazing chapter, it's a chapter that you often get heard called the, the great hall of fame for the men of God. It lists man upon one and woman upon woman who have overcome by faith. These acts speak constantly of righteousness. These acts speak of, of believing God in situations where there is no hope and seeing hope. Some of the characters that turn up in Hebrews 11 are, you think, well, what are they doing there? What's going on? But actually, we know that each one of them lived 
but by something, by faith. I want to just deal with three or four of them because there are, are probably 20 names in that chapter and we'd be here all day and I, I don't really think we should be. Um, I quickly look at the clock just to make sure I even know what time it is already. And um, the first one on there is Abel. Now, Abel only really has a very much of a bit part in the Bible. Um, he and his brother brought sacrifices to the Lord. Now, there weren't any rules about what the sacrifice was. There wasn't even a rule saying you have to do it, but both of them knew that they needed to bring a sacrifice. And Abel brought the very first lamb that was born of his flock. Now, if you think about it, Abel was the first person who was actually a shepherd. So he didn't actually even know whether he was going to get another lamb. But by faith, he took what was the very first, the very beginning, and gave it to God. He acted and brought a worship to God, a sacrifice of worship, not knowing what the future lay. And yet God said, because you have given to me before thinking about yourself, I count that as righteous. You know what? Everything that he counts as righteous, we can only be righteous by faith. God links righteousness and faith all the way through. Your righteousness doesn't come by just doing good stuff. Your righteousness comes by faith. Then we meet Enoch, another person that's not very much in the Bible, but we know incredibly little about him. And some of the things we do know are, are, are sort of mythical things that have been written actually after Jesus. But what the Bible does tell us is that Enoch walked with God. And that's from Genesis 5, 24. And he actually spoke about the coming of Jesus right back even before the flood. We find that in Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Now, Enoch was walking with God, communing with God. It's just, I find this incredibly neat because 35 years before Enoch was taken, Adam died. When Enoch was just a boy, I can just see him getting onto his great, 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 great grandfather's lap and listening to the stories that Adam would have told him about what it was like to walk with God. You know, everybody else had been going off in their own direction. But Enoch said, I want what my great, 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 great grandfather had. I know he messed up. I know he's lost it, but I'm going for it. Enoch pursue God with everything he had everybody around was saying you're mad and then when Adam died he just went on for it and 35 years later God said I'm taking this man out he's pursuing me so much you know he's likely to even to make it and it says that Enoch pleased God because of his faith and then we have a verse that is really famous, and it's interesting that it's in this context. We find there that in Hebrews 11, verse 5, we find that it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That faith was not, oh, he believed for this or he believed for that. He just, his faith was that he believed that he could walk with God. He believed into something that was invisible he believed and his faith brought it into the real and that message really continues with why and this is from the message why because anyone who wants to approach god must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him it's not just a matter of saying oh i know god exists because you know, the bible tells us even the devil and demons know that but it is enough to say, I am going to seek after him. I'm going to pursue him. I'm running after him. Enoch pursued God. 
based on testimonies of a man who was 600 years old. Even though the world had turned his back, Enoch believed God and God said, that's faith. The next man that's in that chapter is Noah. And God warned him about the unrighteousness. And God said, I'm going to do something. You know, Noah could not have imagined what God was going to do. He said, I'm going to destroy what there is and make it all anew. And Noah believed God. He believed God enough to obey God and build the biggest boat you could imagine in the middle of dry land. You know, just everyone saying, No, you're mad. That's a crazy house. What? Do you want to, you know, just what are you doing? He was taunted, and yet we're told that he was a preacher of righteousness. You know what? Noah spent his time telling everyone else, There's a thing coming that is going to destroy what we have, but there's hope in God for a future. In the ark, Noah found the next step. His faith was in the promises of God and he obeyed it and did it. And he waited and he did what he was called to do. Noah had a heart after God. He believed God and God said, I'm counting that as faith and righteousness. I, I just want to grab hold of this because there's something, a beautiful picture here that goes right the way through the Old Testament and the New in Noah. And just really grabbing hold of it as we're thinking and speaking here because he was in the old, he was given the promise of the new, and by obedience and faith entered into the new. He'd no idea what it was, but he believed on what God was saying, what God was promising, and he brought what was invisible by faith into the visible. And throughout the Old Testament, we see people bring, bringing what was invisible into the visible but yet there was something more and the next one that we're going to look at is abraham and god told him to turn his back on his family turn his back on his tradition turn his back on on, on everything he had and come to a new land come to a place where god was promising to give him come to a place and then he said i'm going to fill this land with your people that's amazing abraham knew that he himself would never live to see the completion of his promise but that didn't matter he went for it he went for it with everything he had and it says that he was a man that pleased god he was a friend of god because of his faith he looked around and said, I got stuff here, but I'm putting it aside because I'm believing the promise that God has for something better. And he ran after the better, disregarding the past. When he was stood there and God is saying, go to this land, it was an invisible. And by faith, he brought it into the visible. Even when he stood in the promised land, the creation of what God was doing was still invisible. And God said, look at the stars. And what was invisible by his faith was going to become visible. And Hebrews goes on to talk. Actually, there's a verse there in, in verse 10 of chapter 11, which is just amazing. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on the unseen city with real and eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. Abraham had this vision of what God was going to do, and he ran after it. He kept the vision in his heart, in his mind. 
Hebrews goes on more to tell us about Abraham and Sarah. He majors on Jacob and Joseph, Moses, and then begins to list lots of them. And in verse 10 through 13, it says, each of these people by faith died, not yet having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it a way off in a distance, waved their greetings and accepted the fact that they were transients in the world. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for their old country, they could have gone back at any time they wanted. But they were after a far better country than that, a heavenly country. You can see why God was proud of them and has a city waiting for them. Each one of those people that were classed there had a desire. They had a vision of what God was promising and they gave up everything and ran for the vision. They demonstrated faith. And there's a key there that I just want to throw at you that these people demonstrated that whatever you have a hope for will be evidenced in the way you live. You can tell if somebody is what everybody walks by faith. Let's go from there. Because everybody has a hope or a vision of where their future is. Their faith may be in God, but it may be somewhere else. But we will evidence where our hope is by the way we live. We will evidence where our hope is by the way we live. But God said, this is the kind of faith that pleases me. The faith that takes his promises and says, I'm pursuing them, even though I can't see them right now. I'm believing God enough to give everything for his promises. Faith is the evidence of what you hope for. What was their hope? All the people in Hebrews 11, they had a hope for a, a new country. Noah had a hope for a new world. Abraham had a hope for a new country. Moses. And all the people of Israel had a hope for the promised land. And they were going to run their race as hard as they could to reach that promise. And here is the most amazing thing as we read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us, that their faith and our faith would come together to make one complete whole. Their lives of faith not, are not complete without ours. Wow. You look at Abraham and say, oh, look what he did. And all the, oh, it's been Moses. Joshua brought them into the promised land. And God said, that's not the rest I'm talking about. That actually isn't the land I'm talking about. I'm talking about a better land. And in Christ, we have access to that better land. And because we have access, those who went before have access. They are signposts to us. They had a hope and a desire. They were overcomers in their lives because they gave up everything to run after the promise of God. That promise is a new country, a new place, a new kingdom. These men lived at a time when the law was in place. And certainly after Moses and all those after that, God had given the law. And that law worked almost entirely to do one thing. It worked like a mirror that showed you where your guilt was. 
there were ways of making sacrifices and things but the law gave them an understanding of their guilt so that they were looking knowing that the sacrifices of animals could never do it they knew that there would be a way through their guilt a freedom from their guilt and jesus made the way of entry into the new kingdom there was a desire a desire for that new kingdom they lived knowing there was a city the mark of an overcomer is that he is looking for a new city he is living a life that is based on the hope of the future and that future is not oh one day i'll i'll go away and i'll just hang on and the lord will take me they were living as though they had it now even though it was still invisible their faith was evidenced by the way they lived the hope that was ahead of them absolutely shaped their lives now hebrews 12 verse 18 30 to, to 23 explains this so clearly unlike your ancestors you didn't come to a mount sinai all that volcanic blaze and earth-shaking rumble to hear god speak the ear-splitting words and soul-shaking message terrified them and they begged him to stop moving on to verse 22 it's not that I, that's not your experience at all you've come to mount zion the city of the living god and where the living god resides the invisible Jerusalem. It's populated with throngs of angels and fest and Christian citizens. It is the city where God is judged with judgments that make us just. You've come to Jesus who presents us with a new covenant, a fresh charter from God. He is the mediator of that covenant. We're called to be overcomers. We're called to be people of faith. The sixth mark of an overcomer is that he is a man, a woman of faith. Not just faith, oh, I've got faith to be healed, but faith in the hope that is eternal. The hope that is the promise that is there. Because that hope makes us citizens not of this kingdom, but of another kingdom. In John 18, 36 jesus was before pilate and pilate's saying you know are you a king you know where's your kingdom are you going to be trying to do some you know pilate was thinking that jesus was some kind of rebel who was trying to make a kingdom on earthly grounds and jesus said my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world my servants would fight but now my kingdom is not from here jesus knew and he shared it even with pilate that the kingdom was to come the kingdom was to come and that kingdom is an eternal kingdom but it lives in us we are citizens not of this world but we are citizens of high heaven that's what it says in philippians 3 20. in ephesians 2 19 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of god our citizenship is in the new jerusalem and the way we live our lives here the way an overcomer lives is focused on the hope that guides them that hope is that we are part of a new kingdom and that kingdom is coming to earth that kingdom is going to be populated by the overcomers when we read in revelation we see as god brings that kingdom back to earth he brings with it those who have been overcomers and paul speaks of when it comes those 
who are overcoming but have not passed on will be changed in an instant. There is a new kingdom and the life of that kingdom is in us. The hope of that kingdom is in us. When we began this series looking at the rewards of an overcomer, those rewards all had a future ring. The overcomers hope for a future and a kingdom they can't see, but they live as though it is reality right now. Their lives evidence the hope that is within them. And that evidence is faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Let's check afresh what our hope is. Our hope is in Christ. He is the hope. His hope is within us. When that hope is within us, when that is the, the, just the, the guiding light of our lives, when that hope is the gyroscope that keeps us upright, you know what? We live and we live it out by faith. And God is pleased with that faith. He is pleased when we walk, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the trouble, he is pleased. He is so, so, so pleased. And out of that faith that we live by, comes the faith that sees salvation, deliverance, healing, and wholeness. Because we live our lives marked as overcomers. We saw that the first mark was that we humbled ourselves, that we were born again, that we matured, that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, and we overcame by our testimony. But our faith, that is what overcomes the world, living with our eyes on a new thing, eyes on every promise of God. They may be invisible, but by our faith, we bring them into the natural. Today, let's be people who walk by faith. Let's step up in a new way. Let's step up afresh. Let's call on him. Let's call on him. Amen.